there was once a man who was invited to visit Baja California from San Diego. As is usually the case, a friend of a friend knew someone there. He crossed the border and he remembers walking into the friend of the friend's house and being captivated by an image he had never seen before. He asked about it and he was told the story that you heard today and the image was that of the Lady of Guadalupe. He was so captivated by the story that it began his journey to become a Guadalupano. He was given a poster of the lady and he still keeps that in his living room. He wears a necklace with a pendant and carries a card with the same image in his pocket. When you ask, he tells the story of this encounter with her, his eyes light up and he smiles. A few years after finding her, he visited the Basilica in Mexico City and his heart from that moment on belonged to the sweet lady. It's been about 50 years since that happened. When he told me this story, I was grateful that my Mexican background had given me the context to understand his fascination and his devotion. I am also grateful that his story came to me at a time in my life that my own spiritual journey had allowed me to understand and be open and to listen attentively. By now, I imagine that the significance of the Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico is not unknown to you. But nevertheless, I want to give you some context and I want to start with my own story briefly. After I left the Catholic Church in my early 20s, I tried to stay away from everything related to it. And while I did celebrate the Feast of the Lady of Guadalupe in my younger years, as a young adult, I removed all symbols from my environment. It was not only a blatant rejection, it was also me trying to live with integrity and in accordance to my principles and beliefs. My re-encounter with the Lady of Guadalupe would come many years later, both slowly and quietly, almost imperceptible. It was Dr. Clarissa Pincola Estes who, through her work in her book, Anti the Strong Woman, what allowed me to understand the representation of the Lady of Guadalupe under a different light. And this is what I'm going to share with you in a bit. But first, I want to give you and share something about the presence of this symbol in both Mexican and Mexican-American culture. In 1810, the priest Hidalgo called the beginning of the Mexican Independence War using a banner of the Lady of Guadalupe. And 100 years later, Zapata, during the times of the Mexican Revolution, also used a banner of the Lady of Guadalupe. The infamous crusaders, the Cristeros, carried with them a similar banner. And even Cesar Chavez in the 60s, in the United Farmers work, it carried around a banner of the Lady of Guadalupe. And sometimes now when I attend immigration protests, I see people carrying banners of the Lady of Guadalupe. There is a saying that even Mexican atheists are Guadalupanos. Guadalupanos is a word that is used to describe someone who shows devotion to the Lady of Guadalupe. This may no longer be as true as it was before since the religious landscape of Mexico has been changing so much. But the point that it's trying to make is that in many ways, this image has permeated a culture has given national identity to millions of people. This image has transcended the space of the religious and made its way beyond to signify national and ethnic identity, to become a symbol of resistance and of affirmation of identity. The story and image itself is not free of controversy, of course, 
the debate between those who believe the story of and those who think is fabricated to conquer the souls and spirits of the natives of the new world is ongoing. The debate of feminists who see in the Lady of Guadalupe and the story of Mary itself an image of subjugation that hurts women and those who see also in this same symbol a symbol of boldness and compassion. These debates continue to this day and will continue in the future. Now, speaking about the Lady of Guadalupe apparition in the Tepeyac Mount was not the only of such events in the 16th century. However, the church did a pretty good job at repressing the people and groups who claimed similar experiences, most of them in the state of Chiapas. It had only been 12 years since the arrival of the Spanish to Mexico when the apparition happened. Now, imagine the people back then the previous members of the Aztec Empire and other native groups feeling defeated and abandoned. In many ways, or in some ways, the story itself of the apparition is subversive. For the natives, it was a reminder that they had not been abandoned by their gods and especially by their dear mother God. Juan Diego's story meant that Cuatlicue, their mother earth, their dear Tonantzin was still with them. The Aztecs had more than one goddess, but they revere them as Tonantzin. And I think that's why Mary's words, am I not here, I who I am your mother, are so important. When she appears to Juan Diego, she does so looking like him, you know, with dark and speaking his language, Nahuatl. According to the story, she introduced herself Juan Diego to Juan Diego's uncle, Juan Bernardino, using the Nahuatl word, Cuatlazupe, which means the one who crush, crushes the serpent. The sound is very close to that of Guadalupe, and it is believed that the name was transposed by the Spanish priests. There is also the story that says that the, the Lady of Guadalupe is the same or a different representation of the Lady of Guadalupe or the Virgin of Guadalupe that is that lives in Spain as well. In the place where she appeared to Juan Diego, the Tepeyac Mount, was the place where the natives worshipped their Aztec goddess Tonantzin Cuatlicue, who gave birth to the moon, the stars, the god of the sun and war, and her representation has a skirt of interwoven snakes. Now, fast forward to the 19th century and Mexico's fight for independence. It is believed that the image of the Lady of Guadalupe became at this point in history, an icon of national identity. It, it is the mother that leads her children and protects them in the battlefield the one that reminds them over and over to not be afraid because she is there. Now, if this story was fabricated by the Catholic Church, it transcended its own purpose. Once told, it was let loose into the world and it became its own thing. No other religious celebration in Mexico gathers so many people year after year. Perhaps this was the beginning of the consolidation of the Lady of Guadalupe as a symbol of the oppressed. She appeared to Juan Diego, an indigenous man. Her skin was not the, co the color of the oppressor, but of the oppressed, and she spoke the language of the land. In some foreign lands, the image has become the comfort of the immigrant, the refugee. The one who misses the land and finds in her image a way to work that was left, the homeless, the working mother, the laborers, those who are often invisible and forgotten, they feel seen by her. In a way, she's still appearing to the smallest of her children. 
She has become a symbol of pride for the uprooted and for those who grow up away from the land of their ancestors. They reimagine her in order to affirm their own identity, to reclaim who they are, but also to challenge perceptions of these symbols. Such is the case of the artwork of late Chicana artist Yolanda Lopez, for whom the Lady of Guadalupe was the everyday woman, mother, seamstress. In her image and story intersect the encounter, however violent, of two worlds. She's neither fully European nor fully indigenous. La Morenita, as she's often called, is the representation of both of the children of the land. Today, millions of people will be going to church. Millions have arrived at the Basilica in Mexico City, reverse knees and tired feet. And it's a, as it is a custom, parents and even parents, but may, they may dress up their children in indigenous custom to represent Juan Diego. Many will dance in indigenous attire to the mother of their ancestors their mother earth, their tonantzin cuatlicue. Many will wear mariachi attire and Mexican dresses that symbolize the mestizos. The festivities will be broadcasted live as famous singers gather together to sing to her. And many will be bothered by the traffic in the crowded streets. A few more will be bothered by what they'll consider to be an unexamined expression of faith. I have to confess that I have always been fascinated by popular expressions of faith, by the rituals of the masses, by the devotion expressed in it, I believe, or in them, I believe there's a beauty difficult to pinpoint. It may be their conviction, or maybe just the coming together of so many people around an apparent single purpose. Maybe it is a public expression of their vulnerability as many attempt to pay for favors requested or received from her for the, their own health or the health of a loved one, the return of a loved one for justice. Perhaps is the trust and hope placed in her as activists and rebels use her image as a unifying, unifying image for the cause. The Lady of Guadalupe, the Dr. Clarissa Pinculestes would say, is a representation of the Great Mother, the archetype of the Divine Mother that the indigenous people of Mexico knew before the arrival of the colonizers. The Lady of Guadalupe is the representation of that archetype. This is what she says, and I quote, Archetype is an enormous force that we are susceptible to feeling, seeing, sensing, hearing, but is representable as itself because it's beyond our ability to capture the universe horizon to horizon. Representations are what we can understand. The archetype of Holy Mother, Blessed Mother, Great Mother come to us in symbology, in symbols as the great woman who, for instance, is called the Tower of Ivory, or she's called the Black Madonna, or she's called different things by various people who see her in various ways symbolically. The greater spirit of the archetype actually stands behind the archetypal representation, and it's enormous. We here on Earth who are fully human, we can sense, feel, see, hear aspects of that huge spirit emanating through symbolically in images, ideas, songs, music, dance, that appears to us to come right up to us and to emanate sometimes toward us, but often even through us. So the difference is archetype is a representation of something irrepresentable. The Great Mother, the Holy Mother, is irrepresentable in her magnitude." End of quote. I wonder if those of us who strive for 
an intellectual understanding of the world. If those of us whose theological reflection begins in the solitude of our thoughts are missing the point, at least I feel that I was missing the point as I felt that, that my need to understand was getting in the way of me to see a kind of recurring miracle, a kind of manifestation of the sacred that can only be experienced when you look beyond the story, beyond the image, and beyond the history, and even beyond the religious tradition. My re-encounter with the Lady of Guadalupe allowed me to think deeply, quietly about what was important to me, about the image, about the story. And today, I think that the miracle itself is a voice. It's a voice that is both tender and compassionate, a voice that tells us we are loved, a voice that reminds us to not be afraid because we are not alone. May it be so and blessed be. Let's look at my